All right, all right, Shalom family. Uh, this is your brother, um, brother uh, Takoa Malachi, uh, also known as uh, Brother Morris Williams. Um, today we're going to deal with a, a, a very serious topic. Um, this topic here is something that I think we need to take our time on and make sure that we understand. This is why this will be a series. Uh, me and my brother, Brother um, Joshua, we're going to be taking our time and hitting every area um, of what should we do with the law? Because um, my brother, he did a video called 100% Proof That the Law Is Not Done Away With. Excellent, excellent video. When you get a chance, please go check that out and um, listen to it. And I'm doing just an add-on to that so we can get a full understanding. Because we have a lot of people that follow us and want to make sure that everybody gets the understanding the right way. So, again, this is no slight on anybody, but this is just um, giving you the full understanding. Because now we have a lot of people that's thinking that you, the law is done away with, that you're a hypocrite if you um, believe in um, walking out the laws and commandments. So it's going to be very important that you understand, that you take your time, that you listen. Again, this is just another video that will be a series of videos because the only issue that we have when it comes to um, the law. We're going to be showing what the law is in this. We're going to be showing the difference between what is termed the law of Moses um, versus um, the law of God. Why do they say the law of Moses? Um, and are we supposed to uphold that? What are they saying when they say the law? So it's very important um, that we pay attention, that we get understanding, and that we receive this with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of the Messiah. So that is going to be very, very important. But number one, you must ask yourself, um, just straight out of the the, the, uh, the box or out of the pocket, if sin is the transgression of the law, and we get our, our knowledge of sin by the law, if we do away with the law, that means there's no more sin. That means I can do whatever I want to do. That means that I can commit adultery. If you have a wife, let me have your wife. Uh, if you have um, uh, a car that I like, um, I'm going to come get that. Let me have that car. You can't get mad at that because you're saying that the law is done away with. Um, so therefore, there's no sin because there's not, no way for me to gauge what the father requires or not. So if there's no law, then we can do all what we want to do and just say, well, Christ died, he eradicated the law, and he eradicated sin, so therefore we can do what we want to do. When the scriptures already says, though, um, if we continue in sin, that grace may abound, that God forbid. When we don't have a working understanding of grace, it's not just God's unmerited favor. And I'm going to do a separate teaching on grace to show you by definition of the scriptures what grace means. So this is very important. And let me give you a little wisdom when it comes to studying the scripture, because we want to make sure that we come to the right conclusions. Number one, before you come to your conclusion, you must be able to do a detailed analysis. First, not it don't necessarily have to be in this order, but you need to have these four things that can help you come with the right conclusions because the scriptures interpret themselves. But if you start in the middle of the book, you will always get the wrong conclusions because you don't understand what happened from Genesis to Revelations. If I watch a movie in the middle of the movie, I would not be able to understand the full movie, the full characters who was there in the movie before it came to the middle or the climax of the movie. All I'd be able to do is understand the middle, the climax of the movie to the end. That would give me the wrong conclusion. So it's important to be able to judge your conclusions based off these. Watch this. Number one, I don't have this in there. It's just coming back off the top of my head. Number one, you must have a contextual analysis. Saying what's the context, what's the subject matter of this scripture that I'm reading. And sometimes you got to go back all the way to the beginning of the chapter to get the context of it. Sometimes you got to go to the beginning of the book. You might be in chapter 10, but you might have to go back to chapter 1 to see what is the thing, what is it talking about. Let's see what the context of it. And when you're doing a contextual analysis, you have what is called a post-text and a pre-text. 
the pretext is what is the scripture before the scripture that I'm leaning on saying? Or the post text is what is the scripture after the scripture that I'm leaning on saying? So I can get the full understanding of the whole chapter. Sometimes I got to go way in the beginning of the book all the way to the end. Sometimes I got to read three other books to get the full understanding, especially when it comes to Paul. So I must do a contextual analysis. Another analysis that I must do that's extremely important is a word study and terms analysis. I must be familiar with words and terms in the scripture. And what does that mean? That means that I'm not dealing with, I'm not bringing this Western mind and using Western terms to interpret the Bible. But I'm going into the Eastern culture because it was an Eastern people. And understand their terms, their idioms, their language, their understanding, things that was in their culture. And idioms is basically something that's within the culture that only they would be able to understand. That would be the same thing uh, 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 American idiom is saying that it's raining cats and dogs. Everybody in America understand what that is. But you might have somebody that's over there in some uh, irate place that's in the boondocks in, in Australia that really won't understand that. They're saying, why are you talking about cats and dogs? It's raining. But the people over here in the culture would understand that because that's something within our culture, language within our culture, slang within our culture that we understand. But if you don't understand it by the Hebrew uh, culture, you can come with the wrong conclusions. So you must do a word study analysis when it comes to looking up the word in the Hebrew and looking up the word in the Greek, getting the full understanding of it. And then one of the most important is a historical analysis. What is going on at this time? What is this talking about? Who is the audience? Why is this being written? Especially when it comes to Paul. You have to see what Paul is writing, who he's writing to, and why he's writing the letter. And sometimes you have to go in other epistles that he written to understand what he's saying in another epistle. Because if you don't, you'll make Paul be contradicting himself. And what I always learn. It's never a contradiction in the scripture. It's just something that I don't understand. So when it comes to things in the scripture, you must do a historical analysis to see what's going on, why he's writing this, to get the coach of the people. Let's see what's going on during his time so my conclusions can be right about what I'm saying that he's saying. So that's extremely important to do what I said, a contextual analysis a word study analysis, and a historical analysis. That's extremely important. And the last analysis that I like to do when I'm studying something is a consistency analysis. I'm going to take this to see what is this saying from Genesis to Revelation. And if something changed, why is it changed? And who made the change? Because the who that makes the changes is extremely important. So if I'm saying something that's in the New Testament, and the Mashiach ain't said it, then that's a problem. So that's why it's extremely important to do, like I just said, a contextual analysis, the subject matter, pretext, and post-text, a word study analysis, looking up the words in the Hebrew and in the Greek, a historical analysis, seeing what this is talking about, who it's talking about, why it's talking about this, uh, what's going on at that time, what he's dealing with. Because like I said, if I do a text message a text message on Facebook right now, people would misinterpret my message and they live with throughout my time. And I think about a thousand years for some somebody trying to understand what I'm saying. They would be clueless because they can't follow my intention. So it would take them having to study my culture, after to study um, the, the, the area that I live around, and the people that I was connected to to see my mind in this text message. Same thing with Paul. Same thing with the rest of the apostles. And the last thing to do a consistency analysis to see how consistent this thought or this teaching or this subject matter is from Genesis to Revelations. Because the scripture said it should be line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Okay. That's enough of introduction. Let's get on into this. When they call you a hypocrite for teaching the law, and I had to bring this this way, because what was said, now I'm not coming at anybody in another in any type of way, I don't do tit for tat, but I think you should see the full story or the full truth before, before you make conclusions. All right, this is nothing but shalom, which is peace. Let's move. All right, watch this. 
2 Peter 3 and 15 and 17, because most people that think the law is done away with is because something they believe that Paul instituted. Now, what we got to really understand, who we going to make our Messiah? Is we going to make Paul our Messiah? Or are we going to make the Mashiach, which is Yahusha or Yeshua, our Messiah? Or some say Yeshua. Who are we going to make the Messiah? Are we going to go off to what the Mashiach said? Or are we going to go off what Paul said? But the scripture says that the scriptures can't be broken, so they must agree. So if it's something that seems like a contradiction, I don't go with it because everybody else is going with it. I take my time. You can't be rushing when you're studying. You have to take your time to come up with the right conclusions. Let's see something Peter said during his time about Paul's epistles. Watch this. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 17. An account that the long suffering of, of our Lord is, is salvation, even as our beloved brother Shaul, or some say Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have he written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them things in which some things are to be are hard to be understood. Now Peter is saying, as also in all his epistles, saying that what he read his epistles. They had an order back then. You weren't just throwing out stuff. Speaking in them, verse 16, of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. What is he saying? He's saying you can take Paul's epistles because two, we dealing with 2,000 and some years ago back then that they talking about his letters was hard to be understood. Now you put 2,500 years of misinformation and you think you got the right conclusion by just reading what he said on his letter. And they couldn't understand it completely in his day. Just like I was talking about that, about the Facebook test message thing. You can't even understand a test message that I might throw out right now. We misinterpret them all the time. So you got to be careful. that When I read this scripture, that made me think, okay, I got to study Paul's letter to see what he's talking about. Because it was confusion back then. And he said in verse 16, which they that are unlearned and unstable. All of us are unlearned when it comes to the Hebrew culture because a lot of us are just waking up. So 2,500 years ago, we still, and we ain't got maybe some of us at the most 20 years in being in this. Now we're talking about 2,500 years of misinformation. So that's why it's important to take the unlearned stance and say, you know what? I'm not going to go off what I've been taught on this. Let me empty my cup and re-examine this to see what Paul letter. That let me see. I have to slow down on Paul letters to get a full breakdown and understanding of what he's talking about. Because I can misinterpret what he says. And the scriptures say, to your own destruction. Verse 17, ye therefore, beloved, saying ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away in what error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. Look at what that what Peter warning us. That people was going to take Paul letters like they was doing back then and twist them. And he said, beloved, beware lest you be led away. With error. Led away from what? Led away from what? Hmm. Well, look at that. Led away with error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. Let's keep moving. All right. I want us to look at this. When we're talking about the law, right? Let's look at... What is written in the Torah or the, or the Tanah or the scriptures about the law? Because remember, it was no New Testament during the time of Mashiach or the apostles initially. All that came after they died. So they was going basically off what we know today as the Old Testament. So let's look at what it says about the law and see if, it's, if the law is bondage 
or if the law is a curse. Matthew 22, 38 through 40 says the law is love. Psalms 119, 45 and James 1 and 25 says the law is freedom. Hosea 4 and 6 says the law is knowledge. Psalms 19 and 7 says the law is wisdom. Psalms 19 and 7 says, wait a minute, it says the law is perfect. How can something perfect be a curse and be bondage? Let's keep reading. Psalms 19 and 9, Psalms 119, 42 and 151 says the law is true. Uh oh. So the truth brings a curse and brings us bondage. Psalms 119 and 165, Psalms 94 said, 91 and 4 says the law is protection. But we call it bondage. Uh, Deuteronomy 7 and 15, Exodus 15 and 26 says the law is our healing. Deuteronomy 28 and 8 says the law is our prosperity. Romans 7 and 12, which is Paul speaking, Paul speaking says the law is holy, which is set apart. So the law is going to set you apart to bondage or set you apart to be cursed. All we got to do is think and we'll understand that is talking about different things when it says law. Let's keep going. We're going to break this thing down. Romans 7 12. This is Paul speaking again. Says the law is just. Romans 7 and 14 says the law is spiritual. The same one that says the law is carnal. It's saying the law is spiritual here. Is he talking about two different laws? But the law is spiritual. So nobody that in carnality can live something in that's spiritual unless you what? In the spirit. So he talking about a spiritual law that was given from the time of Adam all the way down up to us. And we're going to show you that. Oh my God, this last one says, or uh, oh Yah, <laughs> or Yahuwah, or some say Ahia. It says the law is pure. Pure. With no discrepancies. Now we got to deal with all those scriptures. If we say that the law is done away with. If the law is done away with. Watch what we did away with. We did away with love. We did away with freedom. We did away with knowledge. We did away with wisdom. We did away with perfection. We did away with truth. We did away with protection. We did away with healing. We did away with prosperity. We did away with holiness. We did away with good. We did away with just. We did away with spiritual. And we did away with pureness. That means we did away with the most high. Because he's all those things. I just want us to just think and really reevaluate the scriptures to know what we're talking about to make the right conclusions. Let's keep going. I hope we're understanding this. Watch this. Let's look what the law brings you. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 5 through 8 says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Most High our Elohim commanded me, that ye should. Do so in the land whether you go possess. Watch this. It says, keep there for them and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nation. Because So if I'm taking away my law, I'm taking away the wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nation. So when people see me living these things out, they're supposed to see the wisdom of the Most High and the understanding of the Most High, which shall hear all of these statutes and say, Surely this is a great nation and a wise and understanding people. But if you take the law away, how can they look at you and judge you based off your lifestyle? If you have no lifestyle, which you have no law, you governed by nothing. For what nation, watch what the other nation is supposed to say. For what nation is there so great who have had to have an Elohim so not unto them as our Yahuwah and all these things that we call upon him for? And what nation is that so great that have statutes and judgments so righteous as all of this law, which I set before you this day? What nations is saying this about us? Now think about most of your Western Christianized places. The world says what? They just like us and they're hypocrites. Because why? They do exactly what we do. Because most of Western Christianity teach that there is no law. 
So they do everything that the lawless people do. They can't look at us and see no difference. They can't look at us and see no holiness, no pureness, and no nothing like that. Because what? You have taught men that it's done. That all they got to do is just say, I accept the Messiah, and that's it. What does it mean to accept the Messiah? Is it just a belief to just say, I believe? It's way, way greater than that from a Hebraic mindset. So accepting the Messiah is taking on the Messiah because it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh that we look that word up. That word means you can look at from word from the Torah and bring it back to what it was saying in John and the word became flesh and did what dwelt among us. So if we put it on the Mashiach, we are putting on his law. We put it on the Torah. We put it on his instruction. Let me keep reading. Deuteronomy 28. And if it shall come to pass to observe to do all his commandments, if thou wilt hearken diligent to the voice of the Most High, which I commanded thee this day, watch what he said will happen. All these blessings will come upon you. So the law now, then, was supposed to bring blessing. But watch verse 14. But it shall come a pass upon you, wherein you hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe all his commandments. If you don't do it, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So the father is saying, if you obey me, it's going to bring blessings. But if you disobey me, it's going to bring curses. But now we're getting over there misunderstanding Paul and think Paul is saying, now if you obey, you're going to get a curse. And if you disobey, you're going to be blessed. Now, what sense does that make? There has to be a misunderstanding on our behalf to think Paul would say, as much as Paul preached out of the Torah, because all his epistles have the, uh, the Torah consumed in it. Have the prophets consumed in it. And I didn't put it in this slide, but like I said, it's going to be a continuation. And you'll see that. I'm going to show you that because I'm going to, we're going to do a video correcting every misunderstanding of what Paul said. All the scriptures that you think that they say that the Sabbath is done away with, that feast days is done away with, that eating is uh, health, uh, eating clean is done away with. Everything that you think Paul said, we're going to, we're going to go back there and we're going to deal with it and bring understanding. This is not to be mean to nobody, but we want our people to have the right understanding. Now, we're not pushing law like the camps where it's law, 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 and you don't have no spirit. But we'll get into that in a minute because it should be emerging of what? Keeping the commandments and walking in the faith, which is the spirit of Yahusha or the Mashiach. They go hand in hand. Joshua 1 and 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but I shall meditate it therein day and night, that thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. So the law brings prosperity and good success. Hmm. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 30, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you would obey the commandments of the Most High, which I commanded you this day, and a curse if you would do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside of the way which I command you this day and go after other gods which uh, you have not known. So we see in here that the scriptures is showing us to obey is to be blessed. You can put that in your own home. Put that with America. And in the world, you finna tell me there's no kingdom nowhere in the world or out of this world that doesn't have laws, that are not governed by the will, the mind, and the intention of the king, which is his laws and his government. But when it comes to the father, the son came and destroyed everything his father instituted. Now, some parts that was just a shadow that the father never delighted in, that the son came and been the fulfillment of. But we're going to deal with that in just a second. But even in your home with your children, your children are blessed when they obey you. But when they disobey you, they get what? Sometimes they get in punishment. Sometimes they get the rod. All right, let's keep moving. But we understand that obedience to the law brings a blessing. That's the thought. Now, we got to go and look during the kingdom time. What I do, 
I like to say what it's saying in the beginning, what it's saying in the middle, and what it's saying at the end. So if we saying that the law is done away with, right? We saying that the Most High instituted the law, showed us how serious the law is. We went into captivity for breaking the law. Then in the middle, the law don't matter no more. Even though all the prophecy says, if you return back unto me, I will come back and get you. And you return to me with your whole heart and your whole mind, your whole soul, fulfilling and walking in the statutes that I originally laid out. But we all like to think he started with the importance of the law. The son came to destroy the law, just to bring the law right back when the kingdom come. That makes no sense. He going to show you the seriousness of it. Send his son to do away with it. Then when the kingdom come, when all wickedness is done, he going to bring it back. Let's see what the scripture says. That is, um, I believe that's Jeremiah. Am I in Jeremiah? Yeah. Jeremiah 31 and 31. Behold, the days come, says the Most High, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them, says the Most High. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my what? Law, which is Torah, when you look that up, in their inward parts. And write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's right there. Let's keep going. Isaiah 2, 2 through 3. The law shall go forth out of Jerusalem in the kingdom. When we get into the kingdom, it's going to be governed by law. So you you going to be lawless now and see what end up happening. And this law ain't just rules and regulations, but it's a love relationship thing where I count it an honor to be able to live these things out and to be under grace so I can have my full intention and full force into living these things out as gratitude unto you through the faith that the Messiah left me. Now, under grace, I can walk in the commandments with not fear of judgment. But knowing that I can please you with my faith to believe that I can walk these things out. Because what? I love you that much. Just like a relationship with a man and a woman. That they begin to love each other so much that it's different things that they wouldn't do when they found out each other's language of love. When I find out my wife's language of love and she found out my language of love. We begin to what uh, honors each other's language of love so we wouldn't... Uh, you know, disregard our relationship. So I counted the honor to do some of the things that she wanted me to do. She counted the honor to do some of the things that I like. I counted the honor not to do some of the things that she disliked. And she counted that same honor because what we love each other and we found out each other love language. When you find out the most high love language, it's a love thing to live those things out. Because now I ain't got to have fear of judgment doing it because of fear, but because of grace, I can work towards getting those things right because I love him. Let's keep going. Isaiah 2, 2 through 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of our Elohim of Jacob. And he would teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth what? The Torah of the law and the word of the Most High from Jerusalem. Now, this is in the kingdom. You can listen to man if you want to. But we're talking about what's going to be going on in the kingdom. So if you're making yourself lawless now and not caring. I'm going to leave it at that. Let's see what the son said about the father law. Let's see if he bought his own type of law. Let's see what he said. John 12 and 48. Watch what the Messiah says. Yahusha. He who rejects me and does not receive my sins has the one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. Watch this. If I did not speak on my own initiative, I didn't come to bring my own thoughts, my own initiatives, my own commandment. 
But the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is, is eternal life. Oh my goodness. Look at what the Messiah said. He said his commandment is eternal life. Therefore the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has did what? Told me to speak. I didn't come bringing my own thoughts. My own so-called religion. My own initiative. My own purpose. My own words. My own commandment. I came to set the record straight and get man off my father law and give you what the fullness of his intention of what he was meaning when he gave the law without man influence. This is why he was saying, I know it was said unto you, but what I say unto you, because what I'm not speaking of myself, but I'm speaking of my father. John 14 and 20. And that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, it is he that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be beloved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And Yeshua answered and said unto him, If a man would love me, he would keep my words, and his words is his father's words. But his words is faith that is in action, showing you the will of his Father. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our bowl with him. And he that loveth me and keep not my sayings, he just told you over here that it ain't just his sayings, but it's the Father's sayings. That keep my sayings and the words which you hear is not mine. Why? Oh, he said it right here. He that loveth me and keep not my sayings. And the words which ye hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. It can't get no more clear than that, family. It just can't. Oh, now this is, to me, this is a case closed right here. But I can understand the misunderstanding. Watch what this says. Think not that I come, Matthew 5 and 17, we want to know his purpose. We want to know what he came for. Watch what it says. He finna tell you with his own mouth. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Think not, think not, think not that I, who? Who is I? Yahusha, Mashiach. I'm come to destroy the law. It should be over right there. He said, I don't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Some of us want to say that I came not to destroy them, but to destroy them. He said, I came not to destroy the law, which my father gave, or the prophets. The prophets spoke everything I was supposed to fulfill. And it's still things that the Mashiach is fulfilling that the prophet spoke. So I must fulfill the things that the prophet spoke and bring the full intention of the law. I'm doing both of them. That's why he said law and prophets. Because fulfill means to feel full or to complete or show the fullness of. So I'm showing you the fullness of what my father said in the law without man interpretation. And you will see that in a minute. And I got to fulfill the things the prophets say about me. I didn't come down here to fulfill uh, adultery. I ain't come down here to fulfill the homosexual law. I ain't come down here to fulfill the bestiality. I came to fulfill what the prophets said, but show you the full intention of the law. And take your judgment for breaking it on me. And become your priest. Well, you will not need a Levitical priesthood before because I'm going to give you the priesthood that was there before the Levite. And take away your sacrifices. You would not need the sacrifice no more in the sense of sacrificing for your sins because I'm that sacrifice now. And now you don't have to worry about judgment and being judged because I died for your judgment. So no, no Levitical priesthood being in the way. Now I could come boldly before the throne of grace now as a son because I'm coming in the embodiment or, the, or, or the, the seat or the stead of the son. So I can come as a son because I'm coming in a full representation of the son because of what he did for me. So sacrificing gone. Somebody being my mediator as far as a man on earth. Now I have the mediator that's in heaven speaking on my behalf. Now I can come boldly before the throne. And now I can live out the commandments 
without fear of judgment, but love. Let's keep going. Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot of the tittle shall in no way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now this is Christ saying this. Now we're going to go and talk to somebody else and think that what the Messiah said was wrong. Messiah telling you right here, for verily I say unto you, there will be heaven and earth shall not pass away or one jot or tittle shall in no way pass from the law, saying that the law will not be abolished or done away with. I shouldn't really even have to do this video. But because we have so many deceptions over the year, we have to bring the understanding to the family. To all be fulfilled. Verse 19, this is the dangerous one here. That's why I'm careful. Whosoever therefore, therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what is that saying? Verse 19 again, whosoever therefore shall break or practice breaking, practice breaking one of the least of these commandments shall and shall teach me in this practice. He shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But who shall, shall ever shall do or practice the commandments or guard them and teach men to guard shall, guard them shall be called great. So you hear the Messiah words, you do what you want to do. Let's look at the apostles. Look at what they said. We ain't got much, we ain't got a whole lot more. Apostles teaching on the commandments. And we're going to try to get done with this in a little bit. First John 2 and 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we do what keep his commandments. First John 5 and 2. By this we know that we love the, we, we, we love the children of God. When we love God, which is the most high, and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. It ain't hard for me not to live as a homosexual. We know that's in the law. It's not hard for me not to sleep with my uh, cousin, with my sister, with my brother, with my mama or my daddy. That's in the law. It ain't hard for me not to um, sleep with a beast. That's in the law. It ain't hard for me not to cross dress. That's in the law. I can live that out. It ain't hard for me not to commit adultery on my wife. That's in the law. And I live that out. So it's we see that it's some things. And the scriptures and the law we have a struggle with, but that's why we have a time of grace in order to get those things right. So the law is not burdensome to me. Let me keep going. Second John 2 and 6. And this is the love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment. Just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk therein. Revelation 12 and 17. I'm going to come back to this. Who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Keep the commandments of the Most High and have the faith of the Son. Revelation 4 and 28. Here's the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of the Father and have their faith in the Messiah. There it is right there. You keeping the commandments and you having the faith in the Messiah. Now we're going to have a video where we break all these things down. Everything Paul said, give you full understanding of what he was talking about. Stuff that he was saying that we can't keep. But we see what the scripture says and the scriptures don't break or contradict themselves. Let's keep moving. Watch this next slide. Who law is it? Moses or the Most High? A lot of us like to say, well, that's Moses' law. Y'all trying to keep Moses' law. I have to understand what you mean when you say that. Because Moses don't have a law that he gave. He have a law that was passed down from him from Yahuwah, which is our Abba Father. It wasn't his law. He didn't come up with it. But if you're saying... Because he was the mediator of that first covenant, the one that distributed the law from what the father gave. And there was a certain law <coughs> that he initiated in blood that he had given. Well, he was the representation of that covenant, just like Mashiach was the mediator and the representation of the restored Behadashah, the restored covenant that was based off sacrifices. But I get to that in a minute. But if we want to call it Moses' law, let's show you that a lot of these stuff was already instituted before Moses was ever born. So let's see who law was. It. Hebrews 9 and 22. According to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So let's see the first place we see a sacrifice at. Genesis 3 and 21. Until Adam also until his wife 
did the Lord, did the Most High make coats of skin and clothe them? When you look at uh, cloaks of skin, that's talking about animal skin. You'll see where they can mean human skin or animal skin, but they didn't kill another human in the garden and put on them when they messed up. It was an animal that was sacrificed. Let's keep going. Genesis 8 and 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Most High and took every clean, whoa, every clean beast. This, this before more, we was talking about clean and unclean eating. Way before Moses' law came. So if you say Moses' law got kicked out, you better still eat clean because it was there before then. Took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings unto the altar. We see a burnt offering there. That didn't necessarily have to do nothing with sin right there, but it was an offering to the Most High. Let's keep going. Leviticus 11 which is clean and unclean before Moses, before Leviticus 11 got here. Let's see it in Genesis 7. And the most I said unto Noah, come thou all thy house unto the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and the female, and the beasts that are clean, unclean by two, the male and the female. So we see right here, you know what he's talking about, clean and unclean? We ain't got to make that that deep. That's talking about stuff that's healthy for your body and stuff that's not unhealthy for your body. It, the, the pig and the shrimps, they have a purpose. They scavengers. They're supposed to clean the earth. A pig can eat anything and he have no way to get rid of his toxins. Same thing with a shrimp. They're in the same family of a roach and they're scavengers at the bottom of the sea to clean the ocean. Then the most high is if the one that created your body, he know what's supposed to go in there. Now you'll sit there and tell the preacher well, no. Christ came and died to make this clean, this kid, I mean, this pig clean. Now you go to the doctor, and the doctor tell you, well, you need to lay off those high cholesterol stuff. If you're eating that pork, you need to let that go. You won't tell him, but no, Christ came and died and made the pig clean. The pig clean now. But your blood pressure still running through the roof. You got that tape, high blood pressure pills because of what you're eating. That ain't hereditary. That's based off your family eating habits. Because your mama and your daddy was eating and their granddaddy was eating that. Let's keep going. Now, let's look at this scripture and let's go and break this down. Let me open this up so y'all can see it. Let's break this down. 1 Timothy 4. Now, because a lot of people use this to say we need anything. Now, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You got to know what he's talking about. You got to do the history on this, on this book. Forbidden to marry. What is he talking about? And commanded to abstain from meats which God have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. You got to know Paul kept dealing with People that was talking about this thing for meats and it had nothing to do with pork. That was food that was sacrificed to idols that they was talking about. But you do your own research. Watch this. Verse 4. For every creature of the Most High is good and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now if I look at that Hold on, y'all, one moment. If I look at that at, at face value, I think what Paul said, oh, yeah, that's right, I can eat everything. Okay, if you can eat everything, go out there in the cemetery and get a corpse and eat that. That's a creature. <laughs> go out there and get some roadkill that been out there a month and go eat him. But you say every creature, all you got to do is pray for it. Go pray for a dead body and eat it and see what it do to your body. Go pray for a roadkill that's been on there for years. Go pray for an infected pig that's bleeding out his behind and got pus coming out his body. Cook him and eat him. The scriptures say every creature is good. Go eat a poisonous snake, a poisonous spider. Every creature is good. All you got to do is pray over it. You've been praying over that food for years and your pressure's still going up. Let's see what this is really saying. Verse 4. For every creature of the Most High is good. Nothing is, be, is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. You got to remember when during their time, unclean animals was not considered to be food. So they know they're not talking about that. But let's couple it with verse 5. Watch what verse 5 say. 
for it is sanctified by the word that kills it right there. So what does sanctified mean? It means set apart by the word. So the creatures that are able to be eaten are the ones that are sanctified by the word. And you have to go to, to what? Leviticus 11 and see the food that is set apart for us to eat. Because that's what sanctified means. It means set apart. So this food that are meats that are able to be received, every good creature, is sanctified by the word and by prayer. It's saying it right here. It's set apart. You got the way you got to go back to see where the food that are the creatures that are set apart to eat. If every creature was good to eat, you should have took this completely. Verse 5 out of the Bible. But it says, for it's sanctified, it's set apart by the word of the Most High and by prayer. Because some of the people were still having problems with eating food that was sacrificed by idols. So they would know what was set up or set apart, but they would have to pray for their country's sake. Because they were still having problems knowing that this food here was, this animal could have been, I get out of the market, could have been sacrificed by an idol. And Paul dealt with that. But we're going to get on Paul's um, letters and other teachings. So we'll show you that he was dealing with people having problems with people eating food that was sacrificed by idol. Let's look at another one. The law before Moses. Genesis 4 and 3. And it, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain bought for fruit of the ground and offered unto the, unto the Most High and Abel. He also bought the first of, of his flock and the fact thereof. And the Most High had respect unto Abel in his offering. Numbers 18 and 12. Now it's Moses' time now. All the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the wheat are the first fruits of them which they shall offer unto the Most High. They are not given to you. So now we see in Genesis and Cain and Abel. They was offering their first fruits, the best of their flock and the best of the ground. We see that in Genesis. But it was established what? In Moses' time. Let's keep going. The Sabbath before Moses. Exodus 28 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall I labor and do all our work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, the God. In it, I shall not do any work, neither do not son, not father, not daughter, not man, servant, not maid, servant, not cattle, the stranger that was in thy gate. Genesis 2 and 3, and God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that is the day he rested from all his work, which God had made and created. I'm going to deal with the Sabbath day uh, and the upcoming teaching also, too, to give you a full understanding of why Christ said he's the Lord of the Sabbath day, and that Sabbath was made to serve men, not men to serve it. The original purpose for it was for it to serve men, but we'll talk about that another time. I hope I'm helping you. Yeah. But got some more laws, the law of adultery, Genesis 20 and 3. But the most I came to Abilach in a dream by night and said, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. This is when Abraham uh, told Sarah to go ahead and pose as uh, somebody that Abilach can have for a woman. And Abilach called Abraham and said unto him, What have thou done unto us when they have offended thee that thou hast bought to me? In my kingdom, this great sin. Wait a minute. I thought adultery was only given during Moses' time. As of this 24, thou shalt not commit adultery. So how can adultery be done away with? And it was already given before. These laws was instituted from Adam's time all the way down. But it was during that Moses' time when he initiated, initiated a covenant with a nation. And he wanted to codify his law on tablets to govern a nation of people that would bear his name. Abraham, Genesis 26 and 5. Watch doing this. Abraham obeyed. Watch this. Because that, that Abraham obeyed my voice, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes. What laws? What statutes? What commandments? They only came during Moses' time. They were Moses' commandments. But Abraham had a charge, commandments, statutes, and laws before Moses. Let's keep going. Let's look at giving a tenth of all your things before Moses. And just to, I just read it. Then uh, Mechizedek, king of Salem, bought out bread and wine 
and he was a priest of God. He was a what? A priest of God. He was a priest of God before any Levitical priesthood. The same priesthood that came from Abraham down uh, <clears throat> to uh, Mashiach. He was a priest of God. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram for by the Most High created of the heavens and the earth. And blessed be of God, Most High, who deliver your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of what? Everything. Hebrews 7 and 9. And as I also may so say, Levi also which received a tenth paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father, then Melchizedek met him. So they're letting you know it was a priesthood that was already here before the Levitical priesthood came. But the Levitical priesthood came to govern Israel as there was a temple up. Let's keep going. Jacob, giving a tenth. Genesis 28, 20 through 22. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God would be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of that that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So we see giving a tenth was already instituted before the Levitical priesthood. Ah, I hope this is making sense. Moses, let's go back to Moses. So we see that these laws was already there before Moses. But like I was saying, he was the mediator of that covenant. And he instituted a covenant with the children of Israel, with the father and the children of Israel. And it was sealed on blood and sacrifices was added. A sacrifices was added because of the people transgression. That's why sacrifices was important because sacrifices kept you in right alignment with the most high. Because when you would break the commandments, you would have to do these sacrifices to do what? Put you back in right alignment. But the sacrifices would only cover your sin, but they wouldn't blot out your sin. And they was never able to eradicate your ability to be in right alignment with the Most High fully because there was some sins which was capital punishment that was there was no sacrifice for. Some of that is adultery. Some of that is children um, uh, talking back to their parents, disrespecting their parents, uh, 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 fooling with divinations and different things like that. It was certain sins that uh, animal sacrifice would not take care of. But this is supposed to be the purpose of the sacrifice. It wasn't necessarily what you were sacrificing, but it what you believed that it was doing. Think about when they came out of Egypt. A lamb was slain and the blood was on a doorpost. It wasn't just the slaying of the lamb, but they had faith in the blood being on a doorpost of what they told them to do that got them delivered. But they had to do what? They had to obey the commandments of doing that first and then put their faith in that blood that would keep them. So that is the reason and the purpose of what those sacrifices was for. So this is why that was important. Another thing is sacrifices was supposed to influence them inwardly. That was supposed to show up outwardly. And this is why it was extremely important when it comes to sacrificing was they were supposed to, when they're sin, if they were sacrificing a bull or whatever it was, the bull represents stubbornness and re represents rebellion. And that part of their nature, they were supposed to be sacrificing that on the altar. So it's supposed to influence them inwardly. So as they began to sacrifice these animals, whatever it was, they would put their faith in believing that this was supposed to put me back in right alignment with the creator. So this is why sacrifice was initially uh, uh, initiated. But if I take my faith out of it, then it becomes work. And it becomes what? Work of law. Because anything that I don't have faith in, then it becomes just a ritual and it becomes a work that I don't put my faith in. Now I can know I'm in the sin and just say I just get an animal and sacrifice him and be good. Because what? Faith is gone now because now I'm not looking at how this putting my faith in sacrificing this animal is showing me that I'm putting my full 
faith that believing that by this animal being sacrificed and this blood being uh, spilled, it is remitting my sins. But Israel start, began to become a ritual and they thought it was nothing. So then it became works and they didn't get the full intention of what the father desired out of that. And it was supposed to be a schoolmaster that brought them into having faith in Christ that would completely eradicate and blot out their sin and put them in, in forever in alignment with the Most High. This is what sacrifice was about. But anything that you take away the fullness of it, the intention of it, and the faith, it becomes works. And all you're doing is what? Working of it. But you don't have the full faith in the blood that's supposed to be sacrificed for the remission of your sins. Israel lost that. Let's keep going. It'll be done in a minute. And we can see here that Yahusha and the Torah, like it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What word was that? The word was the Torah. So it says in John 4 and 16 that uh, Yahusha or Yahshua is the way, the truth, and the life. And it says the Torah, according to Psalms 119 and 1, is the way. It says uh, the Torah, according to Psalms 119 and 142, it says the truth and the Torah. And Proverbs 13 and 14 says the light. So Yahshua is the Torah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he was speaking that he is the way, according to Psalms 119. He is the truth, according to Psalms 119. And he is the life, according to Proverbs 13 and 14. Let's look at real quick. Now, this is another thing you must understand when it comes to law. And people saying the law is done away with. You have to understand that you got to know what it's talking about when it's talking about law. It's not necessarily talking about the full whole law, but they understood what law was talking about. Let me show you. John 10 and 34, Yahushua answered them, it is written, is it not written in your law that said that ye are gods? This is when the Pharisees were trying to get to him and get on him. And he said, isn't it written in your law that ye are gods? Where, where is that written at? That's written in the book of Psalms. We would not, in today's time, call the book of Psalms the law. This lets you see that when it's talking about law or works of law, it's talking about something different or different portions in the law. Because right here it's talking about the book of Psalms. And none of us in today's time consider Psalms the law. So now let's take that understanding. And let's go to the New Testament. Galatians. What is that? Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 18 through 24. For if the inheritance be of law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore do we serve the law? It was added because of transgressions. Okay. What law was added because of transgressions? Because he's supposed to have been gave the law at the same time. But it was a law that was added because of transgressions. Watch this. Let's read it again. Galatians 3, we have verse 19. Wherefore then do we serve the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels to the hand of a mediator. So something that was added was supposed to keep us until the promise that the person that came, which was promised, was to come. So it's showing you what law was supposed to keep us until the Mashiach came. The law of sacrificing. Because by us understanding the law of sacrificing and what we're sacrificing for, it helped us understand the Messiah. So that was, and I'm going to prove that that was the law that was added. Let's go to the next slide. It's going to prove it. Let's show what law he didn't delight in. Now, we looked at before all the laws that he delighted in first. It said the law is pure, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's life, it's um, healing, it's protection. Let's look at what he didn't delight in. Psalms 51 and 17. You do not delight in what? Sacrifice. Or I will bring it. You do not pleasure in burnt offering. Hosea 6 and 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings because they took those sacrifices and made them just works. And they didn't acknowledge their sins. They just said, well, I just bring an offering in. That'll, that'll shut the most high up. We good. So it became ritualism to them without faith. Jeremiah 7 and verse 20. I'm going to show you what was added. Jeremiah 7, chapter 7, verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Most High, Behold, my anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beasts, upon trees and field, upon fruit of the ground, and it shall be burned and shall not be quenched. Verse 21. Thus says the Most High host, the God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake, watch this, verse 22, there, here it is. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Concerning what? Burn offerings and sacrifices. He wanted you just to love him and obey him. Burn offerings and sacrifices was added. <laughs> For, let's read it again. For I spoke not unto you and your fathers nor commanded them in the day that I bought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifice. But this thing I commanded them, this is what I wanted them to do, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I commanded you, that it may go well with you. So the commandments he had already gave, but he added burnt offerings and sacrifice. They had to burn an offering for every every other thing that would become what? Bondage. Because it did what? And never purge your heart or your mind from the wickedness. Let's keep going. Galatians 3 and 20 through 24. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, wait a minute now. Now we read earlier that the law gives life. So we see it's talking about another law, even though it's just saying law. Because what we read earlier, we read that the law gives life. He said, choose this day a blessing of the curse. He said, choose life so you and your, uh, your children may live. So we see that the law gives life, but he's talking about here it had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have came by the law. So we see he's talking about another law. The law that couldn't give you life was the law of sacrifices. Verse 22, but the scripture have concluded that all are under sin that the promise by faith of Yahushua, the Mashiach, may be given to them that believe. Because belief was taken out of the first thing when they sacrificed. Verse 22, but before faith came, before belief came, we were kept under a law, shut up to the faith which should afterwards be revealed. But when faith came, which who is faith? Faith is Yahushua came. We were kept under the law. We was kept under what? The law of sacrifice. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. And this is why he said, I came to fulfill, because I'm, I'm coming to show you the faith that should be revealed. That faith was to lay hands on the sick. That faith was to speak to the winds. That faith was to, to be able to uh, tread upon uh, scorpions. And that faith was to be able to speak to a dead man and call him, call him out from the grave. Lay hands on the sick and then recover. That was the faith afterwards that Israel didn't know about that should be revealed. When they're walking in faith. Verse 24. Wherefore the law. Watch this. What law? Was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. How do I know they ain't talking about just regular commandment? What about adultery was the schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ? Homosexuality was not no schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ. Fringes was not a schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ. But what was the schoolmaster? The schoolmaster was sacrificing because there was a shadow of what things to come. So it tutored me 
on how to think. That way, when the Messiah come, I can receive him and understand what I'm putting my sins upon. That we might be justified, not by works of law, which is just sacrifices, but we might be justified by faith in the Messiah. Because the schoolmaster have left. Now my faith is completely in the Messiah that can eradicate all my transgressions and make me back new and give me boldness on the day of judgment. Because I ain't got my faith in a dead animal. Even the capital punishments in Israel, which Christ can come and give you another chance. Back then, a capital punishment, which is capital sin, you couldn't sacrifice no animal for that. So it couldn't be perfect. And it couldn't justify you. A walking in the, the laws and the commandment don't justify you. Having the faith of the Messiah is what justifies you. But the law makes you sanctified. It sets you apart and helps you be holy. Because you see what the standard is. And because of the, the way, the truth, and the life, which the pattern that the Messiah set, I can walk in his path. Oh, that's making sense. So what did the Messiah come to do? Again, what did he say? Now that I come to destroy the law, what law is he talking about? It is a law that he came to destroy. And that law he came to destroy was the law of sacrificing for your sins. He came to destroy that law. He came also to be your judgment. This is why he became sin that you may become the righteousness of the Most High. So he took on your judgment so you may be declared righteous. Because his death was just to make you free from the penalty of death. And he came to be your high priest. That's why the temple was gone and you don't have no other Levitical priesthood because you knew you was going to be scattered and needed to be under another priesthood, which was the priesthood before the Levitical priesthood. Now I can come boldly before the throne of grace. But he didn't come to destroy it. He kind of fulfill it. We're almost done. Let's look at Revelations 12 and 17. Let's look at, we're going to see walking out the commandments and keeping the faith of the Son. Who keep the commandments, Revelations 12, 17, who keep the commandments of the Most High and hold to the testimony of Yahusha. Revelations 14 and 12, here's the pres perseverance of the saints who keeps the commandments of who? The Most High and their faith in the Son. If it were just talking about both commandments, if Christ bought his own just complete set commandments outside of his father, he'd just say, all we got to do is just have faith. Or all we got to do is keep the commandments of the son and the faith of the son. But it says the commandments of who? The most high and the faith of the Messiah. Same thing with the rich one uh, ruler when he ran up to the, uh, to. Yahushua and asked, what must I do to be um, to receive eternal life? He said, you know the commandments. And he went through the commandments. He's showing you have to keep the commandments. But that ain't going to justify you. Because he said then, when he said, I did that since by you, he said, now, now let me check your justification. Watch this. He said, now say all you have and do what? Follow my faith. Because my faith is going to make you be declared righteous and justify you. But the commandments is going to keep you sanctified and holy and walking. Then Yahushua said unto them, but watch this. This is something else they dealt with that became works of law. Then Yahushua said to them, take key. Oh, I didn't write the scripture down here. Oh, man. That's all right. I can't remember. Just type Google it and you'll see where it's at. I think it's in Mark or John. But then Jesus said unto them, take key and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What is he talking about? Mark 7. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, oh, I can't hardly read that. Let me, oh, let me open that up. That's better. Mark 7, verse 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews except they wash their hands often to eat not, holding tradition of the elders. So we finna get into something. Verse 4. And when they came up on the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many of these things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cuts, pots, brazen vessels, and tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well, has Isaiah prophesied 
of you hypocrites. It is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What is that saying? We can get that back to Israel. Y'all honored us with sacrifices, but your heart went in it. This is why um, the, uh, most I said about, I think it was our, uh, one of the uh, elders back in the day said, you, you do what was right, but not with a perfect heart. If your heart not in it, then it just become rituals and works and tradition. But he said, verse 6, he answered the said him, well, does as Isaiah the prophesy of you hypocrites that is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is from, from, far from me. How being in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold to your traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and men that are such like these things ye do. And he said unto them, For well ye reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own traditions. This is another thing that was being passed down in Israel, traditions over the commandments with the traditions from the Pharisees and Sadducees became bondage to the people. Because they was adding to the commandments of God and putting the tradition of the elders over the commandments. So this is the stuff that the apostles was dealing with. But we do the same thing. We'll say the father law is done away with, but then we will uh, go into traditions of all the Roman holidays, which is your, your Christmas and your Easter and your Thanksgiving, all these type of things. We'll do away with the father's feast days to celebrate false holidays that are to other gods. Verse 10, but Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. Who said, Curse is thy father and thy mother? Let him die to death. But ye say, If a man shall say it to his father, it's his mother, Cormac, that is, is to say a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your traditions. Ye have delivered, and many such like things you do. These are the things that were being added on. So now we understand, we had a brother that said that the, the Mashiach broke the Sabbath. There's no way he can be the sinless lamb that when he was on earth, he broke the Sabbath. And if you read Matthew 12, I'm not going to read the whole thing right now, but if you read that, you'll see that the Pharisees was trying to say that it was unlawful for him to, um, to be picking up corn to eat. Now, this is by their thinking. They're putting what? Their um their thoughts or their judgment on the messiah and the messiah basically said he said let me prove you wrong through your own train of thinking he didn't just say well i ain't breaking the sabbath he ain't had to do that what he said let me prove you wrong let me go into the scriptures and show you what david did then i will end up with saying that in verse eight that the son of man is lord even of the sabbath which that means that means owner so you can't tell the owner what to do and what not to do on the Sabbath because the owner is the one that has been has created it or owns it or it has been given to him. So he knew what the father really desired on the Sabbath. And this is why he didn't pay them attention when they was asked, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Why are you doing this on the Sabbath? He said, because I come to do what? To show you the full purpose of what the father intended. And this is why he didn't break the Sabbath that he owned when he set up. He came to show that the Most High made the Sabbath to serve you and for you not to serve it. But these brothers, which is the Pharisees and Sadducees, they put what their own traditions on top of the Sabbath. So there's no way he can be the sinner's lamb and broke the Sabbath. And we go with that. That's almost a blasphemous statement. Almost done here. What did the apostles do after Christ? Now, this is after Christ now. It was after Messiah. And let's see, did they break the law? Because they understood what the law was talking about. Acts 21. And my brother Josh, she bought this out so you can really go look at the video. I ain't going to go deep into this. But you check his video out on, on the page and you'll see he, he did a great breakdown. Acts 21, the apostles upheld the law. And the day following Paul went and this is verse 18, as 21 and 18. And the day following Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Verse 19, and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things that the Most High wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. 
verse 20. Now, this is James talking about and telling Paul about his conversion and him bringing people in. Watch what he say. Now, this is after Christ. We're saying that the law is done away with. Let's see what it says. Verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Most High and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Yahudim there are which believe, which have the faith, and they are all zealous for what? The law. So they have the faith of the, of the Messiah and they follow the commandments. This is after the death, burial, and resurrection. What did they accuse Paul of? Now let's look. Now we already see that James and all the elders was there. And they, when we see that right here in verse 18, that James and all the elders were there. They was present. And they was talking about all the Yahudim that have the faith that believe and also father the law. So we understand that the law couldn't be done away. Let's look at what they accused Paul of, the same thing we accuse him of today. Acts 21 and 21, and they informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that thou art not to circumcise their children, neither walk out this custom. This is the same thing that we say we're not supposed to do. So we see that. Now let's look at what Paul said himself. Uh oh, yeah, I'm just I'm doing this this video. I'm almost wrapping up, and then we'll get started. Acts 24 and 11. We're gonna see what Brother Paul said himself, since a lot of y'all want to make Paul the Messiah. Let's see what Paul say. Verse 24 and 11. And this is when he's getting chastised, and he had to defend himself in the council. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up in Jerusalem for worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues. He says, since I've been in town, I ain't did none of that. Verse 13, neither can they prove the things whereof they accused me of. Let's look back at what they accused them of. Teaching <laughs> the forsaken of the law, not to be circumcised in the custom of the fathers. Let's see, see what it says. Verse 14, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call hearsay, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing what? All things that are written where? In the law and in the prophets. This is Paul saying this. This icing on the cake right here, Acts 25, 7 through 11. And when he was come, the Yahudim which came down for Jerusalem stood round about and laid many grievous complaints against Paul, which they could. This is everybody still misunderstanding him. While he answered for himself, neither against the laws of who? The Yahudim, where you can you find them at? Neither against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in any of, thing, uh, any of these things. Then Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seats where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as, though, as thou very knowest well. For if I be an offender, or if I have committed anything wrong worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, wherefore these accuse me of, no man shall have made deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So he's saying right here, when it comes to the laws of the Yahudim, and who was given the laws of the Yahudim, they was given by the Most High, handed down to Moses and give to them. He said he ain't offending all those. So why are we going around and saying that the Most High want us to offend all the laws of the Yahudim? Why are we going around and saying that the, the, the laws of the Most High is over with, and he just on trial saying he ain't offending none of them. He said if he did offend it, let him get death. That's what he said. But if he didn't, he didn't commit anything worthy of death. This is Paul, some of y'all own Messiah saying this. Hopefully this is the case closed, but what we're going to do, we're going to take our time. I'm going to do another video. And I'm going to go through every scripture that we think Paul said that came against uh, the Torah. And we're going to get the full understanding on it. So I don't leave nothing undone. So let's wrap up once more, one more time. There's no way that the law can be done away with. Because watch this. It says the law is love. The law is freedom. The law is knowledge. The law is wisdom. The law is perfect. The law is truth. The law is protection. The law is healing. The law is prosperity. The law is holy. The law is good. The law is just. The law is spiritual. The law is pure. According to all these scriptures. 
So if we're taking away the law, we're taking away our purity, we're taking our spirituality, we're taking away our just, we're taking away being good, we're taking away our holiness, we're taking away our prosperity, we're taking away our healing, we're taking away our protection, we're taking away our truth, we're taking away our perfection, we're taking away our wisdom, we're taking away our knowledge, we're taking away our freedom, and we're taking away our love, therefore taking away our God. Read the scriptures, what it says about the law. And then you'll understand what law it was talking about that was done away with. Last thing I'm going to leave you all with is Psalms 19, verse 7. It says, in Psalms 19, verse 7, it says it so beautifully. The law of the Lord is perfect. How can you do away with perfection? Converting the soul. The test, so if you don't have the law, no soul can be converted, therefore no salvation. But there was a law that was done away with, and we already dealt with that. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, the rejoice in the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure and light in the house. The fear of the Lord is clean and doing forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweet also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and keeping of them where there is great reward. Who can understand his, er his errors? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. I shall be innocent from the great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Yahuwah, my strength and my redeemer. All right, we... Hopefully, that's enough information to get you started. Like I said, we got a lot more series uh, coming up where we're going to hit everything about the law. And we're going to go from there. Hopefully, we get you a little bit of understanding from here. Shalom. And for those that say you're a hypocrite for walking in the law, I hope you're able to see this video. Shalom.